Hi, everyone. Um, so now we're going to look into uh, some of the trends within the domains in court and when it comes to domains in disputes. And um, I'll just start off with a quick introduction about myself. I've been, um, I'm a lawyer by education, and I've been in the consultancy for intellectual property and domain and portfolios disputes. Um, have written a book on domain name strategies and the legal aspects of things with Malin Edmire, and currently with the Dot Global Registry. So also wandering around the new GTLD space as of now. So with this thing, um, we have different tools to use when there is a dispute regarding a domain name. Most of us know about the UDRP. Um, it's an alternative dispute resolution system. We have the RPMs the, that were made for the new GTLD, such as the URS. It's even simpler, even cheaper but with a really high burden of proof. Additionally, there's the court system with all of the national laws and specific laws there is. There's also the option of sending a cease and desist letter and just not going to court at all and trying to solve it in a different manner. So now that you know that there are um, ways to handle this, there are really easy ways to address a domain name dispute then why on earth would you go to court and deal with that? Well, there are two things. Either your case simply doesn't, it doesn't belong in the UDRP simply because it falls outside of the scope for the policy, or because you want remedies, you're maybe seeking damages, or you want your attorney fees paid, then you're supposed to go to court with your case. And when a domain pops up in a lawsuit in court, it, it's not always as the main focus of the dispute. It could also pop up just as part of a completely different situation. As Elizabeth mentioned earlier, there are some questions remaining, and that's not just a Swedish problem, it's actually a global problem that we do not, 30 years deep into this whole thing, we don't have a real legal definition of what a domain name is legally. Is it property? And if it is property, what kind of property is it? And what kind of qualities does that property have legally? Who owns it? Can you own a domain name? And if so, where is it located? So these are questions going on, and I'm just going to give you three um, really quick snapshots of instances to illustrate this. One is um, Department of Homeland Security is seizing domain names, and they have been doing this for a couple of years. Um, they go after domains that are involved in either send, selling counterfeit goods or involved in copyright infringements. And of course, just like here, there's been a debate about this. If it is, um, is it unconstitutional? Are they allowed to do this? Is the way that they're doing it right? Um, what about the freedom of expression? What if a domain is a tool for expression? Um, it's also a matter of what's the purpose? Like, why are you doing this? And is it helping? Is it filling the purpose? Leading me on to the next example, it's um, a Spanish site that was hosting links to sites where you could find various um, sports-related content, broadcasting of sports. So this Spanish company was sued in Spain. It was a lawsuit that lasted three years, and the court ended up deciding that it's legal. They're not hosting really anything on their own site. They're not responsible for this. We cannot. It's legal. But what ended up happening ultimately 
was that the Department of Homeland Security goes and um, seizes this domain. Anyways, so there you go. There you have not only political problems, as they, the US authorities are basically overriding what the Spanish court already decided on. It's a Spanish entity. Um, so what they said was that this is hosted on a .org domain name. And since the .org registry is located in the US, therefore the domain should be located in the US. So they took it. Um, obviously, this is where the purpose and actual use of this um, comes into play because what they're actually probably most likely trying to get to is the underlying activity. And they're just removing the domain doesn't mean that they're, they're going to stop what they're doing. This site, this example, is currently back up. It's under a .me domain. And that has, it's not the first time that that happens. Um, third example is uh, just quickly want to mention the ICANN case and the CCTLDs, where there was actually a question of, is the CCTLD something that can be seized? There were a couple of terror victims suing the states. In order to collect damages, they wanted the CCTLDs to be sort of used to pay those damages. So then the arguments were, ICANN is located in the US. So these um, CCTLDs are in the control of ICANN. And ICANN responded to this in a very clear way, in a, in a way that I think is really actually good, so I'm going to read it. It's, they said, a CCTLD is not property. Even if you think it's property, it's not property belonging to the defendant governments. And even if you think it's property belonging to the defendant governments, it's not within ICANN's control. And even if you think it's property belonging to the defendant governments that is within ICANN's control, it's not located within the United States and therefore not subject to seizure by a US federal court. Um, and in an article, I uh, found this quote also that I think is really speaks volumes on the global nature of this and why it's difficult, especially when it comes to domain names and the CCTLDs and what they are. Um, they said it's not a thing, a CCTLD is not a thing. It's a label we give to a series of interlocking relationships and contractual and other understandings that enable the global resolution and the proper direction of messages to and from particular named entities. Nor is it located in the United States. It's located in the global network, in the thousands of interlocking databases that allow the domain name system to function. The Internet Commerce Association also voiced a concern when it came to this. They said that, hey, what if the court says that this is not property? Then how does that you know, play together with what the Department of Homeland Security, for instance, is engaged in? How would that you know, translate? Although they also realized that there may be a difference between CCTLDs and GTLDs and individual domains as such and that this question would not be answered in this court case because it was not part of the question there. And that was true. They didn't answer it. They said that it's not property. They can't use the CCTLDs to pay these damages. But in reality, what they said was they didn't say that it's not property. They just said it's not that kind of property. And it's not that kind of property that can be used for this under this specific state's law, under these circumstances. So it's still an open question. So that was just uh, some of the questions that arise when domains appear in court. Now we have, on the other hand, the alternative dispute resolution systems and what's going on here. And here comes the GTLDs into play, the new ones. Because I'm sure most of you heard and still hear all of the alarms going off left and right about how these new GTLDs is going to create chaos on the internet. It's going to be trademark infringements left and right. Um, we're two years into this now. 
We're on our second year. So I figured we'd look at some stats. There was a 3.9% increase in filed UDRPs with the WIPO um, between 2014 and 2015. Between 2013 and 2014, there was a 2% increase. So 2%, 3.9% up. Um, out of all of the cases in 2015, 14% belonged to new DTLDs. 65% belonged to dot-coms. And there was a total of 280 URSs filed with the forum um, in 2014. So the thing to bear in mind, I think, when hearing about the increase in filings and claims is that there are currently more than 10 million registered new TLDs um, domain names, and there are more than 300 million in total across all TLDs. So 14% out of 2014 cases, 2015, compared to the 10 million that we've seen registered, it's not, I mean, there is an increase, but it's not humongous, and it's not extreme. Not at all as extreme as all of the articles led us to believe going into this. And then you may think, well, how is that? That could be because the right protection mechanisms actually worked. Maybe because the trademark clearinghouse, uh, the claim services worked. Um, maybe some say it even worked too well because there was a glitch in the system that allowed very generic strings to go into the trademark clearinghouse. So as you can see on this um, statistics from the uh, TMCH, a lot of claims notices were sent out probably a lot of them to good faith registrations that scared them off, could be. Um, there's also the possibility of people not really, a lot of brand owners probably don't really know um, what's going on, or they don't know what to do about it and they don't know how to address it, or they do know and they're taking a wait and see approach that's not too uncommon either. So, we have those two things going on in these two fields. So now I'm thinking, just pinpoint a few things that's ahead of us and where that might take things in the next step. The discussion about what a domain name is legally in court and the legal status of the whole thing, like Elizabeth said too about the Pirate Bay case, it's, it's gonna be ongoing. The, it's been ongoing for a while and I'm happy that it's being brought up because it's about time. So um, as far as the TLDs goes, we still have a few launches coming up. A few of them supposed high risk ones in 2015. Um, those could potentially ha play a part when it comes to the number of disputes. WIPO, um, according to their proposed program and budget, will also increase their presence and their uh, educational efforts uh, going forward. So I am assuming that that will play into a lot of brand owners and advisors know more about what they can do and how, how convenient it is to use. And um, I'm thinking that that will have an effect on the, on the number of disputes or cases that we're seeing. We have the very anticipated dot brands coming up. Many have said that those are the ones that will lead the way in a way because they're going to be more visible to the general public. And in uh, doing that, they will raise awareness, and in doing that, they will overall um, give us more registrations in the, in the new GTLD space. And with those additional registrations will come infringements. Also worth noting the emerging markets. We have China, South America, India, a lot of the new registries are starting to make their way into China. It is a complete jungle of rules and regulations, and um, it will take time, but it will be done eventually. Interesting statistics about China that I've seen is um, the correlation between the number of respondents and the number of complainants that they have, whereas, let's say, Sweden and um, the US and many other countries have 
quite a substantial amount of complainants from the country, but not all that many respondents in comparison, whereas China has the complete opposite. They have extreme amount of complaint or respondents, but not that many complainants. And I figured I also mentioned, the, uh, just as a thought, the social media's impact on all of this um, in the, the kind of the era that we're in with social media and a fast pace of communication and information flowing all over the place, it will affect how a brand goes about enforcing its rights and the strategy that they keep. Because if they go about it in a clumsy way or in the wrong way or don't know exactly what they're doing, it will backlash on them so on social media and bad reviews. And that brand damage that can come from that could be more harmful um, in today's world than the actual legal infringement that just that they went after in the first place. I guess to sum it up, it is it basically what I'm saying is that there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things going on. Um, these are just a couple of my observations and thoughts, and I think it's going to be interesting to see the developments in the next year. And we'll just have to stay tuned. Um, yeah, and if anybody wants to read, <laughs> I have promo cards. Just catch me around the venue or shoot me an email. But apart from that, I believe that that was all I had. And I think it's coffee break time, correct? Yeah. Yes, soon. Soon. But first, is there uh, anyone who has any questions for Jeanette? No. So, thank you so much, Jeanette. And thank we you. will have um, an applaud for you, of course. <laughs>